So write down, what are your three or four highest priorities? What are the most important things you think you need to get done? So just take a moment of eye time to do that. How many people are <laughs> frustrated that you don't get to those priorities? You don't feel a sense of satisfaction come Friday that you got those things done? How many people are frustrated with that? So, so, so as you think about that, one of the best practices you can make is to come in on Monday morning, as I said, give yourself 30 minutes of time on Monday morning. And that 30 minutes, just sit down and write out the three, four, five things you want to get done that week. They may relate to this list. Hopefully, they're subsets of this list. If you have a really high priority project or you have a really high priority task that you need to get done, usually you break it down into parts. And those are things that you can get traction on this week. So you want to look at, on Monday morning, what are the things I need to get done this week? The second thing you want to then do is go to your calendar. You want to go to your calendar and you want to look at where those are on your calendar. And you're going to fool yourself by saying, oh, I got Thursday. I got all day Thursday. There isn't a meeting on Thursday, but it's Monday. How many of you have common calendaring systems? People can put meetings on your calendar. You don't even have to approve them, right? Who invented that? <laughs> Jeez, come on. I mean, you should at least have approval rights before they can lay something on your calendar. They put a meeting on there that they want you to go to. How many people have noticed you get to a meeting and you realize you don't really need to be there? How many of you notice that? Yeah, I mean, look at that. I mean, but again, you're polite. So you sit there. You sit there for a meeting you don't need to be at. It's amazing. Now, you figure, you fool yourself. You think, oh, I'll take out my iPhone and I'll work on my iPhone. I'll waste time two different ways. So if you go in Monday morning, plan your priorities, look at your week, don't fool yourself. If Thursday's open, put in there a two-hour block to work on. Put in there one of those three or four priorities. Block it out in your calendar and don't let people override it. Hold on to that time as precious. Look for where in the week you can plug in your priorities because they won't get done if you leave it to chance. Second strategy that you need to have. First, you need to have priorities and you need to allocate your calendar time to do that. Second strategy you need is to think about capacity. How many people took Economics 101? Great, okay. So what's the fundamental lesson of Economics 101? Supply and demand. I mean, really, go into your organization and just ask them, how many projects do we have? And people are like, oh, I don't have no idea. It's like, wait a minute, who's running this place? I mean, you're the managers, you don't know how many. I said it to a dean, I said, okay, tell me how many projects you got. Let's just make a list of them. What's the project pipeline look like? And the dean says, I can't, I can't tell you. Well, tell me the big projects you got. Let's at least put those down. So we put down four or five of them, and we agree. Okay, at your next staff meeting, take the chart and have other people fill in the rest of the projects. And then what I want to have us do is think about those projects and what the rough order of magnitude of that project is. Are we saying it's a two-day project, a two-week project, a two-month project? That's all we need to know. Let's just put in the rough order of magnitude on those projects, and then let's find out who, one or two names, who are the most critical people on that project from a resource standpoint? Is it a technologist? Is it a business analyst? Who are the critical people? Let's put their names in here. Okay, and then tell me, tell me, just tell me what the next major milestone is. Let's pick that date, and let's then sort of put all the dates in here and I can predict with near certainty where your train crashes are gonna occur. I don't know anything about these projects, but I can tell you, you've overcommitted your resources. You've overcommitted your key resources who can't possibly fulfill all of the commitments that have been made by this organization because nobody is in charge. Nobody has what we would call in manufacturing the production control function. When you're asked to do something, Think about having a conversation for results. A conversation for results, there's a, a breakdown to a conversation for results. If I ask uh, Alan, can you do this project for me? If he says yes before he's had a discussion about the conditions of satisfaction, shame on him. If you call me up and say, look, we'd like to do a leadership development program, I can't say yes. I want to I ask you questions like, 
What, what cohort, what constituency do you have in mind? When are you thinking about doing it? What resources are in play? And then I got to go back and look at whether we have the capability to deliver that in the time frame that you want. And so we're going to have a conversation for results. The conversation is really about the conditions of satisfaction, which really have to do with what it is the customer wants, when does the customer want it, and what resources are available for us to use to try to achieve the end that you've asked about. If you don't understand you're in a conversation for results when you're talking to a customer who's made a request, then you're not very effective in your role of negotiating what the conditions of satisfaction are, which means that you're probably better at making what I would call predictions than you are at making promises. Now, some parts of IT have figured this out. The development folks, software development, took a bad rap for about 10 years, predominantly 1990 to say 2005. By 2005, software development organization figured out we got 40,000 hours of development time. We have more customers than we can count, and they are making 60,000 hours of requests for us to do development. And they got a steering committee together, and they said, look, we don't care how we spend these 40,000 hours. You tell us what the priorities are. We are in a losing game when you come each to us individually and ask us to do just this simple project. I mean, it's only 1,000 hours. Come on. You people can't be responsible. Come on. You can't do this for us. And so you were put in a, a situation which was untenable. You're trying to make all these choices one off with nobody doing any collection of what the the aggregated set of requests are, and so they form a steering committee. And once or twice a year, the steering committee meets, and it sets the priorities. And those people who are in software development understood over time, if they want more than 40,000 hours, we can do that. But you have to tell us well in advance, and we have to contract for people outside who can supplement what we're doing. They already understand how to integrate with what our architecture is, so we're going to develop preferred relationships with certain contractors who can absorb the additional capacity. So they got a plan. They got a plan first to prioritize and second how to allocate those resources in a way that makes sense to the people that they're serving as stakeholders. But many of you don't have any way in which those requests come in so that you can aggregate them. You have a hundred front doors in IT. I mean people can ask Bill to do something in the hallway. And, and he feels obligated to say yes. And if I'm being asked by the faculty, I feel even more obliged to try to figure out how we can get that done, even though it would have been great if they asked us three months ago because they didn't need it until the start of semester, and now it's two weeks from the start of semester, and now we've got to figure out how to do it in the last minute, which now increases my immediate, and it really isn't important, but they're important, so I've got to get it done anyway. So I suggest to you that learning how to have conversations or results is a skill that every manager needs to have. And when people approach you with a request, you ought not to say yes so quickly. You ought to ask some questions to understand better what the conditions of satisfaction are. And some of this is negotiating. If they really do need it by December 15th, I, do they have some resources that they could put into this that would help us beat that deadline? And that will help you become a more reliable, credible organization. So the second strategy is you've got to understand within your unit at least how to do capacity planning. If you don't understand what the capacity of your unit is to deliver, then you're not managing. And you only can do that if you can measure your capacity. So think about how much do we, can we get done and how do we do the intake in a way that begins to align supply with demand. And that will help you be more effective in, in many different settings. Your calendar is a strategic asset. If you don't understand that, then you're not spending your time and your talent very effectively. All you have is your time and your talent. That's what the university pays you for. Whatever number you spend at work, 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, how do you want to spend those? Spend them at the highest and best use. That's really where your value proposition is. If you're going to meetings, as you indicated, that you don't really need to be at, then you're not using the strategic asset that you have effectively. 
And so you have to think about how do I gain control over my calendar? How do I start to use my calendar to really prioritize my time and my talent so that I'm using it at things that are really going to have value? So protect time on your calendar. Look out a couple of weeks. Save blocks of time for you to do the important work that you want to do. And then be disciplined about that so that you really don't let other people override those blocks of time. Another whole area for you to think about is within higher ed, decision making is a complex area. And, and so how do we make decisions in higher ed has a huge implication for people's time. And I appreciate that within a shared governance organization like Paul talked about here, where Senate's very active, the faculty want to be involved, that faculty by and large think about governance in one of two ways. It's either consensus, we're going to try to all agree on this, or we're going to take a vote. And either way, that can work for a faculty member. Within your organizations, we are not always trying to get consensus. I think we would be far wiser if we thought about decision making on a continuum. And on that continuum, there's more participation on some sides, less participation on the other side. So if you think about delegating, if I really delegate this task to Mike, if I give Michael this job to do, then I should really help him understand at the outset what the expectations are, what the output looks like, and what the time frame is, and then let him go and now he should make most decisions regarding that project. That's what delegating looks like. He should not be coming back to me each time like you talked about yesterday when people ask you, what do you want me to do with this? How, do, how should I go about doing this? If you keep answering those questions, you're creating dependency as opposed to giving them the opportunity to feel empowered to run with that. You want them to own those projects and to be part of that. There are times when you really operate from a consensus mode where people are participating in the decisions. And I'm afraid in too many of your meetings, People's default, the people, because we don't talk about what the decision-making mode is, people think we're trying to work towards a consensus here. And I would say that's not true. In most cases, you don't need a consensus. It's not necessary to have a consensus. It, it's a great deal of time invested, so it should only matter on things that are really critical. Those decisions, perhaps, weren't getting a consensus. I think most of the time, you would be far wiser to recognize that the decision-making process in play is a consultative decision-making process. We want your input. We'd like to hear what you think. And then we're going to go off and develop a solution or a straw. And, and you know, if you want to get back to people and share that straw, great. You can show them, here's, what, here's where we're thinking about going. But do it in email, because they'll be too busy to answer. And then you say, you know, you got a week, get back to us in a week, and boom, we can move forward with that. But the, but the meetings that just keep meeting, to keep talking as if we're going to get to a consensus about something. I don't even think people understand what a consensus is. So the default is the expectation that we're all going to agree here. Well, understand that the test of a consensus is, Dean, can you live with this? Well, in fact, at work, I can live with a lot of things. I mean, nobody said it quite that way. We were talking about whether it was A, B, or C. Think about it in meetings, what we're doing most of the time is more consultation than participation, than consensus-based. And sometimes we're just delegating it in a way that might be more effective uh, some of the time. You could help us move more quickly if you were a little more sophisticated about decision-making modes. And in higher ed, I have far, far these situations where people would just say to me, "If I just wish somebody would make a decision. Delegation is another strategy. And, and again, some of you are used to doing things yourself. Some of you are perfectionists. As I said yesterday, other people might refer to that as a micromanager. As Annie said yesterday, that blue pencil, it's very tempting to put things in your voice, to have things read a certain way that you like them. But that really is taking away the ownership of your folks. People really can step up. Almost everybody who's gone through this program goes back and has a renewed sense of what to delegate and how to delegate and how to see that as an opportunity to develop the people around you. If you're going to a meeting that doesn't have as much impact, that really doesn't require you to be there, and you let somebody on your staff go to that meeting, they're going to get some exposure to a different world that they don't see very often. When, when you ask people how they learn, Exposure and experience are the two biggest contributing factors to how people learn. 
So think about handing off some things that you might do that would give other people the opportunity to learn, to grow, to expand their capability in ways that also gives you the chance to go do the more important work. If you can't learn to delegate, you'll never be a leader in the way that we're talking about it here. Because you'll never have the time or the mind share to focus on things strategically. I said to a CIO I was working with, when I looked at his calendar, I said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how you ever do the leading stuff because all your meetings are an hour, 30 minutes, back to back, all day long. Yeah, I, you, if you're going to do some serious strategic work, you, you need a couple hours to think about things at a deeper level. What are you doing that's under your pay grade? And, and I had a senior director go through the program. When they went back to their office, they realized there wasn't a single thing they were doing that was really at their pay grade. Almost everything they were doing was below their pay grade. When Raphael Reif uh, came uh, to our leadership workshop at MIT, uh, Raphael, who's now the president, when he was the provost, he said, the hardest thing for me to do as provost is the provost job. Almost everybody comes to me and asks me to do something for them that I understand and I, I, I actually want to do for them, but it's not my job. It's the dean's job. So a faculty member comes to me because they know me, and they say, can you help me get this done? When it's really the dean. It's the dean's job to help them get that done, or the chair's job to help them get that done. And so I have to keep reminding myself, I'm responsible for the provostial tasks, and if I'm not doing those, nobody else can do those. You're responsible for leading and managing your unit. If you're not doing that, chances are nobody else is. So if you're doing things under your pay grade, Who's filling the void that you've left that's supposed to be helping us maximize our ability to use the people in the process to get the products and services delivered or helping position us to add value in the future so we're not going to become irrelevant over a couple of years because of benign neglect on your part. So think about on page 31, what are the things that you perhaps are doing that are really essentially your job? The things that require your expertise, your political sensitivity, what are the things you could teach other people to do? What are things you've held on to because you do have a certain understanding of the situation or the task? How do you hand those off to other people? Or, see, what are the things you're doing? If I walked around behind you, Mint, and I watched you all day long, I, I'd say to you, what, 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 are you, what are you doing that for? Come on, that's not your job grade. I'd dock your pay by the end of the day. I'm sure you'd be down 30% on your daily wages because you are working under your pay grade. It's not to suggest sometimes that isn't warranted. Sometimes you gotta roll up your sleeves and help, but if that's a practice, if you're constantly doing things that aren't necessary at your level, then, then you're not doing the work that really is your charge as a manager and as a leader. In summary, let me just suggest that in order to really focus on the important, there's some strategies you can use to enable you to really devote time to the priorities that matter most. The first is you have to have those priorities set. Every Monday morning, write down the three to five things you want to get done that week. Second, you have to think about how to balance demand, how much people need from you with your ability to, to meet that demand. So having a capacity management program makes sense. Third, you want to take command of your calendar. Your time and your talent is a strategic asset. You have to understand the way you allocate that resource is critical to your success. And some of your time, most of your talent, should be spent on the more important priorities that are going to make a difference at the end of the week, at the end of the month. Another strategy is to become more decisive, move us along more quickly, consult, don't look for consensus on everything. Consultation, asking for input is sufficient. In most cases, that'll help us move at a faster cycle that allows us to meet the challenges of moving faster within a higher ed environment. Uh, leverage delegation, you can't delegate enough. Ask yourself who can do this, not whether you could do this, and develop your people. Those strategies will help you really find some cycle time to focus on the important.